you know, in my lessons, we used to play scales. He would go to the piano and he would go bing, 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 bing. And I would have to play a scale with the piano. Well, forget about that in Baroque music because we don't play an equal temperament. So I had to learn how, what, what thirds were all about, what non-tempered thirds were all about, what close fifths were all about, what big fifths were all about. The fourth is suddenly, a, it's not a perfect interval, it's a dissonant interval, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I had a wonderful time connecting with today's guest. We just barely scratched the surface of the topics that we are going to talk about. So we'll definitely do a round two in the future. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations. And we are having on the show today, Richard Myron, who is from Brooklyn, but has spent his professional career in Europe working in the early music world, which is what we're talking about today. He lives in Paris. He's professor of bass and chamber music at the conservatory and wears many hats, plays in many Baroque ensembles, early music ensembles. And we talk about that. We talk about growing up in New York City, his time at Juilliard with Homer Mensch, how he found himself being drawn into the world of early music in Europe, parallels between jazz, which is a passion of his, and early music, how the scene for early music has developed over the decades in which he's been working, and a lot of other things. Let's just dive in. Here we go. Richard Myron. Hi everyone, this is Trevor Jones, Jason's colleague at Contrabass Conversations and the Double Bass Blog. I am here to introduce you to my new podcast that I'm hosting, The Scholarship Roadmap. It features the voices of professional musicians, musician entrepreneurs, and student musicians. This podcast is in support of my music mentorship program for student musicians pursuing careers in music also named The Scholarship Roadmap. You can find the podcast on all podcasting platforms at thescholarshiproadmap.com, and you can connect with me on Facebook and Instagram at The Scholarship Roadmap. Thanks, and I'll talk to you soon. All right. So okay. what So what time is it in Paris right now? It's 8 o'clock in the evening. Okay. Okay. Thanks for- How uh, are you? You're in California. Yeah, I'm, I'm in San Francisco. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. And what is it then? It's nine hours difference. Yeah. It, oh, it's 11 a.m. or just about- it's 11 a.m. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 11 yeah. to 20. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. how is it in California? It's, it's, uh, th- things are great here. Have you spent time out in San Francisco before? Um, Very little. Okay. I, I, I've been a few times. I played a few times. I played in Berkeley a couple of times. Mm-hmm. I played in, uh, um, I have never played in the big halls. I used to do these tours back in the 70s and the early 80s with uh, the New York Chamber soloists mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in those days. And we used to play in the Dinkelspiel Auditorium, which is maybe in Berkeley. Yeah, that I, I'm 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 pretty sure that's in Berkeley. Yeah, in Berkeley, and then there was one in Palo Alto that we used to play, and I yeah. can't remember. Yeah, there. No, I, 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 I don't do a lot. I, I basically do no early music playing myself, besides like you know, kind of. Well, that was on modern. That was modern that instruments, was modern. but it was baroque music. Okay, um, in those days, yeah. Well, I because I know that the Bay Area has a has a thriving scene yes, for period performance. Exactly. Yeah, and so you were very lucky. Yeah, you have a wonderful uh, orchestra out there, and and a ter- with a terrific conductor who is unfortunately. Uh, doing his farewell year and his end of year's fantastic programming has all gone out the window. Yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really a shame. Uh, it, it, Nicholas McGeegan, I, I'm sure you're familiar yep. with that name. Yeah, he's a fantastic musician, and he's done really great things for that orchestra in in. The Philharmonia Baroque Orchestra. Yeah, cool. the 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 bass player uh, uh, Kristen Zernig uh, is, play, plays with that group, and I've I had her on the podcast maybe a year ago, two years ago, or something like that. Uh, uh, she lives she lives over in Oakland, or she did at the time live over in Oakland. So I took the ferry uh, over to her, met yeah, up at this. I don't beer actually hall. know her. Yeah, you know, I knew I knew it. I knew the group when Mike Burr's wife mm. was 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 the bass player. Mm-hmm. Michael Burr, the former principal bass player in the in the orchestra mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in the San Francisco Symphony, mm-hmm. his wife was the bass player in Philharmonia Baroque in the beginning. Wow! I, forget, I don't remember her name, Michelle Michelle okay. Burr. Okay. 
That's right. And it's her name. And she, so she was the, the original bass player there. Michael Burr is a former student of Homer Mensch, as, as am I. Who you studied with. Yeah. And actually, I, I'm th- trying to think of who else. Uh, Rob, Ka- I'm trying to think of people that I know that studied with Homer. Rob Cassinger, who's in the Chicago Symphony. Was, yes, a little later, a, a little, little later. after, after yeah. me. Yeah. But the names that I heard, funny enough, they were the names, a lot of the names that, that, that came after me, I heard because I had a, a, a terrific student. I was doing a summer program here for a few years, and uh, we had a guy from Brooklyn that came. Sam Zagnet is his name, a terrific young bass player. That name sounds really familiar to me. He's a, he's a pupil of David Grossman. Okay. So he comes out and does the L.A. Chamber Orchestra every now and then, I think. Okay. He plays with Dave. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, so we uh, he he made all of his applications to all of the to all of the schools, you know, a few years ago. And now he's just gotten his master's degree okay. from Yale, okay. which is great because that's where I advised him actually to, to go. And so all the teachers that he was looking at, well, Grossman and, and uh, Orrin O'Brien, Donald Palma, uh, Cassinger, uh, mm-hmm. so many of them had passed through Homer Mensch <laughs> in, yeah, one, right? in some way or, or another. <laughs> and uh, so it was a nice time. I was there in the 70s. We had a wonderful class, and we have we're good friends still. I have good friends still from that class, and uh, he was a terrific teacher, terrific bass player. Sounds like it. I never I never had the honor of meeting him, but I know so many people that have that have spent time with him and, and studied with him. I, I, even you know later generation than Rob Cassinger, a bass player named Kate Nettleman, who's in the Minnesota Orchestra now. She studied with with Homer and had all ah, these wonderful okay. Homer tales. You know from well, the, the, the principal bass of the Philharmonic, the LA Philharmonic. Uh, the, the Tremblay, and then there's the other guy. Um, oh yeah, um, well, cr- uh, who was in Dennis Lewis, Lewis, Chris Hanulek at, at, at Chris right Frank. now. Yeah, yeah. He's also a pupil of Homer Mensch. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Okay, wow. He plays with a German bow. Well, yeah. So, so it's not quite so <laughs> so evident because Homer Mensch was very very much a, a, a French bow guy, mm-hmm. and he was he suspected somehow the German bow. <laughs> he, it, it's funny. He said, "Well, I don't know. I don't know. I've always found the French bow easier." And and uh, he even went so far as one of his pupils, who wound up in the Concertgebouw Orchestra later on in her life. Uh, she was at school with me and he had designed a bow for her mm. because there was a guy who was making bows in my years named uh, LeMay mm-hmm. in Kentucky. He, Gary Carr played one of his basses. That was his claim to fame. He was made the first copy of the Amati oh, for wow. Gary. Okay. Uh, Lawrence LeMay, I think was his name. Yeah. He, was, he was an interesting maker, but Homer concocted this bow that was basically a French bow with a, with a German frog. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's how far he, he went. But it was it was a very nice experience. Wow, that's great. Wow. And where is your your playing background? You're mostly have been playing as a jazz bass player no just like a freelance classical bass player i play a very modest amount of jazz i mean i play a little bit of jazz yeah. um but I, I grew up in south dakota so off 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 oh, okay. the beaten off the beaten south path dakota, well you have in south dakota i must say it, it, for those of us who are in yeah. early music we all know about vermilion and we all know about this unbelievable collection of instruments that is in south dakota Yes, uh, the Shrine to Music. It was originally called, now I think it's the National Music Museum or something like that. I can't remember the exact time. I've never been there, yeah. but well, I've heard. Oh, it's great. I was, things. I was born in Vermilion, actually. That's my, that's okay. my, that's, that's my, and then my, my father taught at the university that's there, the University of South Dakota and my mother. Oh. So Arnie Larson is the person who founded that museum. My mother, hi mom, uh, t- took violin <laughs> lessons with Arnie, uh, back in, back in Vermilion. And the, wh- I don't know the whole story, but how this town, I mean, Vermilion, South Dakota is 10,000 people on a good yeah day you know it there's is a university. there's a so, uni- there's a university but i mean it, it is off the beaten path you know it is it's oh, it's about an oh. uh, and and it just that and you go in and you see it's like why all these strads and amadis and it's like yes. and, and i yeah. oh, uh, uh, uh fellow classmate of mine at northwestern university was doing a uh, an, uh, an internship there i think it was an internship and she i was visiting and she took me back into the the storage of that place and i 
Oh, it is incredible. I went into this room. It was like a science fiction movie. All It was just room after room. And I went into one and it was nothing but euphoniums. Like people, because oh, wow. people d- uh, donate all these people instruments. People things now. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. And so it's just, you're just like looking. It's like, I never, more of euphoniums than I can imagine. You're just all like wrapped in plastic to, yeah. you know. Well, we, we, I mean, we have a nice museum here in Paris, of course. Yeah. We have very wonderful instruments. But I have to say, when I uh, it's, sooner or later, when you start doing research about this guy or that guy, and then they talk about a special gamba that he had or a special violin that he had, and then you get to see it's now in the it's in the collection of yeah. University of South Dakota, and you know it keeps me thinking like the, the University of Southern North Dakota at yeah. Hoople, or the <laughs> Stikini Bach thing, and okay, <laughs> but but in fact it must be a fantastic fantastic collection uh, someday i'll someday i'll get there but i don't know when, 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 but someday yeah it, it is a fan it is a fantastic collection but it, it and it's just it's just so strange to me that that is there i mean it's it's one of those tales i need to i need to do some research and figure out exactly how that came to be because it's just seems like the most uh, and no d- no uh negative feelings towards South Dakota, but it seems like the most unlikely play, like San Francisco, I could understand New York. I could understand yeah. Boston, you know, but like Vermilion, South Dakota, you know, I, I yeah. So it's, it was a lucky, <laughs> lucky twist of fate as it were. <laughs> well, it's, uh, and you're, fr- you're from New York, right? You're I'm from, from Brooklyn. I was born in Brooklyn. Exactly. Wow. And then I moved uh, at nine. We moved to Nashville County, Long Island, which is mm-hmm. slightly t- it's on the same island as Brooklyn, mm-hmm. just a little further to the east, and no longer a part of New York City. So I was in the Nassau County school system, which is where I, I started playing music. They uh, they said to me at a certain point that uh, I had I, I, in the fourth grade, I think, I wanted very much to be a guitarist. I still have a great passion for the guitar, in fact, funny enough. But uh, there was no guitar offered in public schools, so they gave me a cello. And I caught on very quickly, but but never took it anywhere. And then at about 13 or so, uh, uh, one of the teachers said, well, listen, you should switch to the bass because you're a big guy and, and, and the bass shouldn't be a problem for you. And then, you know, when you go to college, you can work on weekends, or playing club dates, you know, weddings and stuff like that. And the bass is a more versatile instrument than than the cello and and i said well okay so i uh, they gave me a bass and so i learned how to, how to play the bass and then of course i really started to be a musician when i got my first fender bass which nice. is how i started as a musician and i started playing you know b- covering like blues and stuff with my friends in, in long island in a, in a kind of a funny 15 year old cover band and and when I was about sixteen, I was playing in a band. One of the guys is is a, is a fantastic musician. He's a composition teacher in San Jose. Larry Polanski is his name. Great, great musician. And so you know that goes back to the rock and roll. I started my life as a musician uh, playing the Fender bass. Like I'm sure a lot of my colleagues, whether they'll say it or not, a lot of my colleagues probably started the same way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it was natural to go to early music in the end. Because somehow, uh, I mean, I didn't stop ever playing modern bass and modern music, and I still play a little bit of jazz, and I still play a little bit of Fender bass, but basically I've been earning my living for the last 35 or 40 years or so playing more early music than, than, than any other thing. But it was for me, it was like a lifesaver, because I could I could still be in a rock band, sort of. You know, I could still be the bass player on yeah. stage. Instead of being in a section where, I, which I loved, I loved playing in orchestra. It was a great, you know, I'm playing Mahler symphonies and playing Bruckner symphonies and Beethoven symphonies. It, it, it's it's great, of course, and it's it, and you can play loud. <laughs> you don't have to worry about every note. But but then I discovered playing continual. It was like playing rock and roll or playing jazz. I was responsible for the same thing in a baroque band that I was in a rock band. Yeah, it's so. And it's, that was where it got. Me. The, that's something that I've I, I've seen as kind of a commonality with people that that 
uh, are drawn to early music is is either like uh, being really into jazz or being really into contemporary music, both of which yeah. typically are you as the bass the bass player. There's a, there's a bassist named Jerry Fuller who does a lot of early music. Yeah, playing. I know, I know, I don't know him personally well. We've been on the phone a few times together, but of course, I know who he is. Yeah, that's great. Well, he and I lived down the street from each other back in in Chicago, Evanston, Illinois. Oh, okay. I I taught his son bass for like five oh. or six years. And so, were you in, were you in uh, Northwestern in the days of Warren Benfield? No, I. I I, I was uh, after that, but I, but of course Warren is a you know the, the legendary name. I, I was yeah. I was there after Warren Brent Benfield. Jeff Bradisich taught there, and I got there right as Jeff was leaving. So, but but oh. but uh, Warren was still doing private teaching in the area, and yeah. um, was Jeff was in school with some friends of mine that I knew from uh, from Aspen School of Music it was a festival when I. I was in Aspen. I'm showing my age a little bit, but I was in Aspen in 1976 wow. in the bicentennial year, <laughs> and uh, and where I met a lot of. I studied with John Deke, and I studied a little bit with Stuart Sankey, and uh, but basically, I'm a Mensch product from pretty much A to Z. Wow. I've spent five years at Juilliard with him, and uh, I had a teacher before that who had also studied with Homer, and but he more or less prepared me to get into the school. Mm -hmm. I, I started learning how to play uh, the painful thing of learning really how to play when I got to Juilliard. And, and many of my colleagues were far past that, that point. So I had to catch up a little bit. Wow. Because I started a little bit late uh, on, on the base. So that was, uh, you know, m most of the people, I started about 16 and uh, really seriously with the teacher, with the bow, with, 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 with some mandal etudes. And, um, yeah. and uh, the guys who I were in school with had already been with Homer Mensch at 16. So it was really qu quite a quantum leap that I had to take at, at that point. When, when did you start taking lessons with Homer? Was it at Juilliard or did you take some lessons before? Okay. So, I was 18. Okay. So yeah. in one of these days, I, I've, I've done this with other teachers before, but, but like I've talked to a few people for the podcast that have studied with Homer and I, I'd love to someday put together a stories of Homer about Homer, yeah. what his teaching was like. So well, just, yeah. It's really interesting. I can give you my, my own quick, quick Please. flash because yeah. I had such, such great respect for his, his playing the guy could play so fantastically well it, it really uh, he had it all figured it out he had it all figured out the bass for him it was like a puzzle that he had just figured out over the years and over the years and and uh, his teaching it wasn't it wasn't like how can i describe it? it wasn't teaching us how to be musicians per se it was really teaching us how to play the bass mm. then then you went where you went but but as he used to say to me, no student of mine will ever leave my class if you can't play a perfect detaché. So so if you can imagine the, the, the basic truth of that, because playing the bass, if you cannot really have a brilliant detaché, I'm not talking about like spiccato and all the fancy kind of bouncing stuff, on the string, Beethoven's fifth, you know, like, the way Toscanini wanted it, the way that all these guys wanted it, that he grew up with, you had to be able to play like that. And when you when you could play like that, then you could do whatever you wanted. But you had to be the fundamentals, the, the left hand, the elbow down, the shoulders square, the head up, the, 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 you know, all of these basic things that I hear myself telling my students every week. <laughs> You know, it's funny when you teach, I'm lucky. I'm a lucky guy. I teach in the Conservatoire de Paris. We have wonderful students, wonderful, talented students. But I always say, uh, you know, and they say, well, what can, what can you teach a talented student? Say, what do you mean, what can you teach a talented student? Even, even Roger Federer has a coach. You know, Tiger Woods has a coach. Nobody's going to have to teach Tiger Woods how to play golf. But sometimes even these guys, like, like Tiger Tiger Woods or Roger Federer, they have mechanical problems that 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 creep in because you've been injured, because you know you had to play a Wagner opera three times in a week and your bow arm hurts, and so you cheat to do things, and so you need someone to to control this stuff. And there Homer had no equal. There he was. That was his greatest, I think, 
he could he could find the thing that you were well of course you 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 have too much weight on your left leg or you look look at how your hips are they're not they're not straight you and you know and and so these are the kind of things that I appreciated the most. We didn't spend one minute talking about early music. I mean, in five years. <laughs> but I can tell you that everything I do is related to something that I learned pretty much from him. Wow. And then well, I took it my own way afterwards. Well, well and you know, so that's a, a good uh, thing to explore. Like, when did early music come into the picture for you? And, you know, there's uh, an area of music that I think has has witnessed a lot of change over the last few decades, too. So it's probably a different world yes, when, yes. You, when you first encountered it. So uh, how did you get introduced to it? What was that like? Oh, Just tell me about that. Interesting. It's an interesting story. I had a, a fantastic teacher at Juilliard who was the harpsichord teacher. Uh, his name was Albert Fuller. And Albert Fuller had a class, a graduate uh, master's class, uh, called Style and Interpretation of 17th and 18th Century Music. And I was interested in that music. I loved Bach. For, for my whole life, I loved Bach. And and so I thought that that was, you know, how, what, little did I know, but I thought that was where it all started. And in fact, that's, in fact, that's almost where it all ended. <laughs> that's where it all leads to but but uh, there I was uh, in his class and one day he was teaching us about uh, uh, Vivaldi and, and we all thought of Vivaldi as a string composer and a violin composer and then he wanted us to know that he was also an excellent vocal composer and so he had someone come in he sat down at the organ he had someone come in and sing an aria and asked uh, uh, if anybody was here that could play the, uh, the continual part with a bow. And I had the bass with me. I said, well, I've got a, a double bass, not a cello, but I'll play if you like. And he said, great. Okay, come on up. And so we played, we played this aria. And he said, oh, thank you. That was nice. Listen, come, come after the class. I want to tell you something. I said, okay, great. So I thought he would talk about what I had done, what, how I played. And uh, none at all. We, we finished the class. And he said, come here, I want, I want to talk to you. And he said, you know? And he looked at me square in the eyes. And he said, forget about this symphony stuff. Forget it. It's not for you. You belong in this world. Now, that was the first time that any teacher had ever told me what I was, should be doing. Everybody has been telling me, no, you don't do this, don't do that, you know, don't do this, don't go here, don't go there, don't don't play with this kind of bow, don't, you know. And this guy said, do this. So I said, okay, that, that sounds logical. And so I started playing more Baroque music, but always on modern instruments. And then some guys in New York uh, hired me for some things, and, and I was very lucky. I met some cellists. I'll talk about them afterwards, but the... The, the, it was in the late 70s or beginning almost 78, 79, 80. And a guy called me in to, to play something. And he said, but got strings, got strings and a broke bow. So I said, well, I've got a, I've got a German bow. I'll, I'll play that as a, I'll, I'll make it as like kind of a fo phony Baroque bow for a while until I can get one. And I put gut strings on a Tyrolean bass that I have, that I still have, <laughs> and funny enough. And, uh, and so I started doing it. And I realized that the fact that it was at, at A415 didn't bother me at all because I don't have perfect pitch. So I can play at every pitch. I can play at 392, 415, 430, 440, 460. And none of an A is an A. You tell me that's an A, okay, that's an A. And I'm okay with that. And, and I realized that this is, he was right. This is what I was meant to do, to play this stuff to play this kind of music with this kind of sound and with this uh, that little did i know all of the rest that came afterwards that i had to learn fit all like little pieces of a puzzle I, I i learned that you just don't play you know in my lessons we used to play scales he would go to the piano and he'd go bing 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 and i would have to play a scale with the piano well forget about that in baroque music because we don't play an equal temperament so I had to learn how, what, what thirds were all about, what non-tempered thirds were all about, what close fifths were all about, what big fifths were all about. The fourth is suddenly a 
it's not a perfect interval, it's a dissonant interval, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of these things, but it all made sense to me. And I said, well, yeah, of course. What, you know, why should we play an equal temperament? They, you know, they didn't start doing that in, until they started modulating. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, and, and Baroque music only modulates in a very limited amount of keys, you know, until you get the well-tempered clavier, which, which is in all of the keys. However, Bach has a temperament for the well-tempered clavier that he figured out that it's not equal. Wow. So, so in fact, equal temperament was used in the 17th century already for fretted instruments. And then it came back in the 19th century for the pianos. And, and for, for, you know, uh, this kind of uh, German expressionism, Liszt and, and Wagner and Schumann and, and, and this music that tends to be uh, endlessly uh, from dominant to dominant to tonic to tonic in, in, in modulating from one place to another. And if you're not in equal temperament, it's very difficult to do that. Uh, so I've learned over the years that equal temperament and and unequal eighth notes and all of these things came came later. It, but the thing that got me, that got my ear, was this the sound. The sound for me was perfectly natural. Whereas many of my friends, that's the thing that keeps them sort of away from it. Is that they can't get used to not playing loud and they can't get used to the, not trying to play everything sustained. <laughs> and yeah. uh, you know, I couldn't get an orchestra job now if you put a gun to my head because all my F sharps would be too low, all my B flats would be too high, and I would never be able to play loud, loud enough. But, but, but it fit for me. So I'm very lucky that Albert Fuller, who later became a good friend and, and a trusted, trusted uh, uh, counselor to me, uh, he introduced me then to a guy named uh, Freddie Arico. Fortunato Rico, wonderful cellist, who brought me into some of the professional world with him, as well as another cellist in, in New York named uh, Myron Lutsky. These were the two guys who I learned from as a continual player, with Edward Brewer as a harpsichord player and Jim Richmond as a harpsichord player, two two fantastic musicians as well. And so I I learned from the I learned from these guys. And, but, but if I hadn't really been ready to learn, it probably wouldn't have worked. I mean, I was ready for that. And it reminded me so much when I got the, when I got the gut strings on it. I remember once playing a Messiah and then having to do a club date afterwards. You know, like 11 <laughs> o'clock, we hit at some, some nightclub in New York. And I brought the bass with gut strings with me. And I tuned it up to 440. And I, and I suddenly, went, wow, you know. This is it. This is this is what Mingus sounded like. This is what Paul Chambers sounded like. Okay, yeah, the gut really is a different voice, and so so that's what that's what got me into it. The the fact that Albert gave me advice, and that when I took the advice, it didn't it wasn't right away. It took me a while, but when I finally took the advice, uh, it fit. It was all right. Wow. So that's where, so that's where I got in. That's how I got into it. And then when did when did you end up moving to Paris? Was that right after Juilliard, or how did that? No. What? Well, how did that all? Well, so that what all happened? happened after, yeah. yeah, that's happened. A, a sort of a how can I say a, a, a confluence of circumstances or something. I uh, I remember uh, uh, when I was uh, young, out of Juilliard, there was a, a, a group. Pierre Boulez had a had a, a chamber orchestra. In Paris, if they, and, and uh, an American, Mark Martyr was was the bass player, mm -hmm. and uh, he decided to leave the group. And I thought about going and trying to audition. Was Paris seemed like such a, but I never did it. I never went, and so I sort of forgot about it. And then some years later, I met a girl who was from Paris, <laughs> and we uh, we subsequently uh, got married. We're still married. 34 years later, and uh, and we uh, we decided at a, a, in 1986 to move to, to Paris, and uh, because she had family here and she wanted to be close to the family, and I for me I was a bit of a gypsy at that moment. I said, well, why not? You know, and I realized that there would be much more early music in Europe than there was in New York. And, and, and uh, was that the case at the time? Was it? The, yes, the, okay, yes. okay. It was still, it was already uh, highly developed. And there mm. were, 
there were in England, there was enormous amount of recording going on in Holland as well, in Belgium as well, France as well. There was a lot of a, a lot of professional uh, opportunity to to uh, play early music in those days. And so I, I started playing not right away because you never you never start right away in a new town. You always have to cut your teeth a little bit. And I started playing with a group here and which led one thing to another. I became a member of a group in Germany, in Freiburg, uh, which, which was, is a wonderful group that's still going very strong, one of the best borough groups in the world. And uh, I started playing a little bit in Spain with some people and in Belgium with the, the Koikins and uh, Gustav Leonhardt, and people who have made a really profound in, in, in influence on me. Gustav Leonhardt was, is, was an incredible influence on me an incredible musician. And, uh, and he taught me enormous amounts of, of things that, that had to do with mostly with articulation and how, how dynamics are so closely related to articulation, something that I was never taught in the modern world. You know, how, how important it is to ar articulate correctly each, each, uh, um, how can I say each affect, each mood that you're creating with the music? It's the articulation that are also in Baroque music highly codified, and a certain rhetorical gesture means something, mm -hmm. and it will always mean that thing. So, so that part of it, of course, for me came much later. You know, all of the all of the really interesting stuff comes once you've accepted. The easy stuff, like how does it sound? You know, the Ray Charles thing. How does it sound, man? How does it sound? <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, and so my own experience of rock and roll and jazz, and, and still, I still listen to that music a lot. All of that helped me a lot in the early music world. Because in the end, like he said, how does it sound? You've got to, when you're the bass player, you've got to make the band swing. Mm -hmm. Now, swinging for Count Basie is different than swinging for Gustav Leonhardt. But both of them want you to swing the band. And, and, and there's, the, there's the great parallel. Yeah, no, that's really that's really interesting, and I, can, I the, there's so much not on the page or interpreted, and my such limited experience about the, the the most I can relate is I for maybe eight or nine years I played the uh, the Messiah in Chicago, like the big Messiah that was done, you know, period players, but a, a large portion of period players but at a440 you know and so i was like the, i was the 2d bass and i was jerry fuller's page turner you know for all the things and so i and i would watch and see how it think he was notating things and bracketing things and then this really wonderful uh uh baroque cellist named craig trumpeter was the cellist who is the the play you know playing the continuo part and it was all you know the the organ baroque organ and everything and so it was all yeah. you know and i i, I spent you know a, a decent enough chunk of time of that and subbing if they really were in a pinch and they needed me uh like the broke band so i'd tune down you know on my modern yeah, because bass. there is yeah. there, there, there is a uh there is quite a nice community of broke players in chicago oh no? yeah mm -hmm. it's a, there was a group even mm -hmm. there I yeah. forget what it was called. Yeah, there are a few, there are a few that that ours Antigua I think is a group there. Um, I think Baroque band uh, is based there. I don't know how well known they are outside yeah. of Chicago, but but so I've I've been around that enough to know that there's a whole world I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not so hard to you know it's really not so hard to understand when you it's not more difficult for instance to understand than, than playing a, a project that I'm mounting now. That I'm putting together now, playing uh, the Zodiac or Stockhausen, where you have to go into a vocabulary, you know, or or uh, or if you're playing, for instance, 17th century music on a violone, it's it's not the same as playing uh, 18th century music on a double bass. Yeah, it's it's uh, different. Uh, I have I've been using for a long time uh, a, a three string bass. Playing Italian music. Wow. All, mostly any Italian continual that I play now, I play on the three string bass, which goes to a low G, which is, you know, the G on the on the E string, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the lowest G on a bass. 
and because that was the note of reference at the time. The low G was the low note, not the low C. The, the organs didn't have 16 foot stops. So they were not going, they were not doubling the, the, the cellos down to a C. It was going down to, to G, like the theorbos and the, and the harpsichords. What, uh, what, what, so, are the, what are the other two strings tuned then? If you got the low G, what, what or G? G, D, 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 I oh, use G, D, G, G, D, G. Okay, that's and, a good uh, And then when I go up to the 19th century, I use A, D, G. Okay, okay. Which is a little bit, or for some pieces, depends what key the piece is in. You know, if the piece is in a key where I need a lot of low A's, or low B flats, then that's not a problem with the with, with the, an A. But if I'm playing a, a music, and for instance, it's it, it I need low G sharps, you know, to for for to make uh, modulations because when you when you have thirds in the bass in, in a lot of that kind of music, it signals a modulation. Mm -hmm. You know these great chords that you learn the theory class, the Neapolitan sixth chord and the German sixth chord and the French sixth chord. These chords that they never explained to you what they were. You just had to learn that, you know, this one was, was this, this one was that. Well, those chords are all, the third is in the bass. Mm. And it's an altered sixth chord because the, the normal sixth in that key that you're playing in will be altered to, to make a different dominant chord to a key that you're modulating to. So those are these alter six chords, if you don't have a G and you then you can't get the G sharp, mm -hmm. which is often an important note. You 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 need it. So that's and even some sometimes it's even I mean an F would even be better because that's really the low, the, the low, low note on a on a big arch lute or a big theorbo. But the, but that serves serves me well. But of course then I use I, I, the only one I don't have is a five string. I've got three, I've got four, I've got six, but a five string I don't. So when I play, when I play Bach, for instance, I use a, a tuning uh, on the four string bass, which is low C, G, D, G, like like an Italian cello. Does that take, does, uh, uh, you know, as somebody who just like, I play in fourths, that's what I do. Does that, yeah. I, I imagine oh, yeah. that takes some getting used to. I'm also imagining that someone who specializes in, in what you do, you, you just get used to it. I, and, and quick tangent, I don't know, do you ever, have you ever run into Dean Farrell or had any, uh, uh Dean Farrell is, is another story, is a story on his own. Okay. Yeah. Right. For, sh for, for sure. But I remember talking, we, we could chat for a long time just about, Dean, but I remember talking to Dean about playing some jazz gigs actually because he's like like yeah. into alternate tunings and he I don't know what tuning he was in but it was something that like it's like he was able to play all open strings but he was in like A flat or something like that and some oh, bit he, he's, <laughs> he's taken that really far he plays a lot of Viennese tuning the Viennese tuning is something that's that's that has come to life thanks to early music sort yeah. of yeah. Uh, uh, Viennese tuning you know which is thirds and fourths is a very interesting tuning. I don't do it a lot. It's uh, I, I I do it. I mean, I learned the tuning and I can I can play uh, the, the chamber music, but I'm not a big Viennese concerto guy. Mm -hmm. uh, although many of my, my my friends and colleagues, there are great players, uh, guys who are doing fantastic work with, yeah. with Vienna tuning. Uh, uh, but I, it's not my favorite music, so I, I prefer playing the violone in 17th century music. Than the than what's called the Viennese violone in 18th century music. I prefer the the uh, the gamba, the contrabass gamba, yeah. and play that because the music is for me more personally more interesting. Uh, but uh, the pieces that I've played, uh, I've, I've I've played the the, the Dittersdorf Symphonia Concertant on the Viennese tuning and the Mozart Serata Notturno and uh, you know pieces like that, the Van Hal trios, some Haydn stuff, the there, there's a lot of stuff that you, you know, that's interesting and that I like to play on that tuning and, and that you shouldn't play with another tuning. I mean, that stuff, Sperger and all that stuff, it's really, it, it, it's, it doesn't sound as well. Per questa bella mano doesn't sound as well in, uh, in a, on a modern tuning. And it's not easier on a Baroque, on a, on a Viennese tuning, by the, by the way. That's a myth. <laughs> it, it's just as difficult, yeah. but it sounds better.
Yeah, I, I remember, I don't remember who the player was, but back in, in when I was at Northwestern, uh, the bass teacher at the time, Michael Huvnanian, who uh, uh, passionate about early music too and de- did a fair amount of playing, uh, he brought in somebody with Viennese tuning and was demonstrating some of those pieces. And I remember thinking like, whoa, you know, it's so, yeah. so radically yeah, yeah. different. Yeah, not easy, but well, just like the way it lays out. Yeah. Completely different. Completely, yeah, the, the layout of it. And, of, and much of it is meant the real virtuosity in Vienna tuning bass is with the bow mm-hmm. more than with the left hand. There's a lot of barring. There's a lot of chord structure playing like a gambo or like a guitar, like an open tune guitar. If you think of like a drop tuning uh, G tuned guitar, like Robert Johnson or one of those guys, uh, the chord, there's a major chord there already. And so, you know, the Rolling Stones, I mean, the Rolling Stones, that tuning is the Rolling Stones. Every, every, every song has set, you know, since, since yeah. about 1965 or 66, when he started doing that, it, mm-hmm. you know, those chords, those Rolling Stones chords come from an open tuned guitar. Now, for, for, the, for the Viennese bass, you have a low F, natural, then A, D, F sharp, A. Now, the, the F on the bottom is probably to give the bass a little more punch. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but I often, my colleagues, and uh, I myself often tune to a D. It depends. Some pieces are written with that tuning with the F, and you have, you have to use it for the barring and for the fingerings. But... but um, the the top it's it's basically a, a second inversion of a, a D major chord, mm-hmm. A D F sharp, A with the fifth double. Oh, okay. uh, so that's why all the pieces are in D major, <laughs> D major, <laughs> or or in E flat, uh, in E flat because they tune the bass up a half tone to get it a little more to give it a little more punch, and um, so yeah, so there you have. The, the 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 Viennese bass was the virtual the first virtuoso school mm. before Dragonetti. So it's so interesting. Uh, you know, it's it's funny because somebody if somebody who plays on steel strings might think like w- how crazy it is to be doing all this tuning. But I remember talking a few years ago, several years ago at this point, with John Feeney about yes. uh, about a guy I was uh, in school with as well. Okay, yeah, and and just about because he you know I, I, he was talking about the different work that he does and all the different tunings, and he says, yeah, I just use the same set of strings for everything. I just tune them up yeah. or down. And I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but gut seems to be particularly well suited to tunings like that it sort of settles into the new tuning in a well, way it, it, it's a living it's a kind of a living uh organ- mm-hmm. <laughs> organism it's yeah. a kind of a stretch but it's not it's it's organic material yeah and any kind of organic material when you when you stretch it out if you haven't stretched it out too far it will adapt and when you when you loosen it and when you take the tension off until you reach the point where it won't sound, it will adapt to that as well. And uh, of course, it changes a little bit sound qualities. But yeah, I know John uses gut all the time in playing in the modern orchestra, and I I, I do as well. I, I think I don't. The only steel strings I have are on my Fender bass. The rest of it, is, <laughs> the rest of it's gut. Well, John has this great video. I'll have to I'll have to try to dig up. Uh, and I don't remember one of the broke uh, or early music period performance groups in New York City did this video with him demonstrating how just the how gut is. It's almost like an analog versus digital comparison. Yeah. Like gut, yeah, there's just like yeah. yeah, there's like world with worlds within worlds of the sound that you can get, which is really interesting to me to yeah. to think about. But you, that you can you can get that, and of course with. With every truth, there's there's always another side that's true. <laughs> you know, sure. with every really great truth, the truth, the real truth is that gut really does have more sound possibilities than than metal. Mm-hmm. But the real truth uh, on the other side of it is that, of course, there there are disadvantages like like uh, like going out of tune easily. If it's raining, the strings swell up. If, if it's cold, the strings act differently. If it's hot, the strings act differently. Uh, there, there are, you know, you, you can't, I, it would be difficult playing Valentine 
with <laughs> uncut strings, right. I suppose it could be done. But I mean, I, you know, I, I would, or, or maybe a better example would be the Berio Sequenza, yeah. <clears throat> where you really need all of this kind of clanging and mm-hmm. and and all of the the stuff that you can get from a from a metal string. So there is there are advantages to metal strings for for what it's doing. Yeah. But for instance, I. I I've never heard a jazz bass player that I liked better on steel than on gut. Mm-hmm. And I can think, I mean, the best, you know, Ron Carter and, and, and Mingus, and though I saw all of them live. And, and, uh, and when I saw Ron Carter, the first time I saw Ron Carter, I think he had steel. Then he went back to this nylon, mm-hmm. labella nylon strings that he used, and it sounded much better, I thought. And then I got Miles Smiles and, and Nefertiti and, and, and all that stuff. And I said, whoa, this is all gut. This is not metal. This is gut he's playing on. And it for me, it was Scott McFarrow, yeah. uh, Charlie Aiden went to the end with gut. And all those guys, the, the I realized that that this sound that I grew up with, you know, Haitian fight song mm-hmm. on, on gut and, and, and with Mingus, I said, wow. And I listened back. I said, yeah, of course, this is, these are, this is gut, this is gut mm-hmm. that they're playing on. And, and I always use the example of Yasha Heifetz, who his whole career played with a pure gut D and A string in the middle of his violin with a round, wound gut G string. So it, it didn't hurt his technical abilities or yeah. his cleanliness when he was playing. And so I realized that you can be just as clean. Listen to listen to the the uh, Gary Carr's first re- recording mm-hmm. on Golden Crest Records. <laughs> it's called Gary Carr plays the str- the double string bass. There we go. The picture <laughs> on the cover. It was made when he was about twenty years old or twenty one years old. It's phenomenal, by the way. It's phenomenal playing, and it's gut. It's on gut. Wow. Yeah, and, and, and listen to Kusevitsky, mm-hmm. the recording of Kusevitsky, which is nothing like, like our own conception of how we should play the bass. However, the sound, even, even transferred onto a CD from a 78, is fantastic. And it's, it's like no sound you'll hear today. Yeah. Uh, uh, John has even gotten his colleagues in New York at St. Luke to play on gut it's fantastic i mean it's a great thing it really is yeah i guess maybe one of the only disadvantages is that that instability if it's uh, really hot or really uh or it's oh, raining I, I, to live with that. yeah i yeah. wonder i wonder this is just my crackpot theory but i wonder if part of the reason why the bay area here became such a thriving early music scene is that it's always the same weather it's probably less of a pain in the neck you know it's always it like it's, <laughs> <laughs> it could be i think i think that Probably the Bay Area became a, a, a real center for Baroque music because you didn't have, uh, and I and I choose my terms guardedly. Don't don't get me wrong. My New York friends don't get me wrong, but New York's mafia was far too strong to let something new touch ears. Mm-hmm. You know, they. they uh, I, I was fortunate I, when I met Albert Fuller and all those people. He introduced me to Jap Schroeder. Who was a wonderful violinist and who was very much responsible for he and Stan Ritchie from Indiana uh, University. These guys were responsible for, for putting the Baroque violin pretty much on the map in, in America, you know, and, and, and yet Ya yeah, played a lot of new music and played a lot of modern violin. But after a while, he said, why are you bothered playing on these steel strings? They don't sound as well. And I think that the mafia in New York who kept guys like that off of the off of the beat, the main stream, you probably didn't have in San Francisco. Right. So such a strong counter current. You also had money in mm-hmm. San Francisco, in Silicon Valley, and you also had open minds. Yeah. Right. So right. that combination, money, open minds, and and a, and a, a lack of controlling interests. It's the perfect place for that to sprout up. Yeah. And you have these little places. If you look, you have Cleveland, Chicago, there are places. Boston has become a major Baroque music center. 
Now New York is becoming a, a more mainstream and Baroque because of Juilliard, because Juilliard added an early music program, and, and which, which of course was extremely predictable. When Juilliard does something, it legit, legitimizes everything, <laughs> in everyone else's eyes. Yeah, and so so it became legit to be Baroque suddenly, and now they're producing terrific students. To, Terrific violinists are coming over to Europe and playing as well. And they're they're uh, Toronto. Mm -hmm. I I was teaching. This is uh, the first summer that I wasn't uh, going back, but for six years I was teaching there in Tafel Music's summer program for two weeks. It's wonderful. The orchestra is fantastic. Many pupils of Stan Ritchie. Mm -hmm. um, many. Uh, 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 Many who have studied in Europe, the, the, the orchestra became a wonderful, wonderful orchestra. And uh, so there's this little hot spot there. Then there's a hot spot in San Francisco. Los Angeles is a little slower to come around. Mm -hmm. New York is slower to come around. Uh, Florida, Miami, which is so important for the youth orchestra, is, is very little, not yeah. much. But, you know, so it goes here, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here. In Europe, it's much more mainstream. Mm -hmm. it's, I always, it's always interesting how things develop and in what ways and what confluence of things. That I, I, and I think you're, you're it's certainly much more than the weather. That those, those factors you're describing are probably why it took off in the Bay Area. Yeah. What's, uh, what's, are you in Paris? I mean, I know you teach at the conservatory. Do you live in Paris yes. too? Okay. I live not far from the conservatory, in the northeast part of the city, in fact. Okay. I live, uh, so it's, I can actually walk to, to teach, uh, a 20 minute walk. Well, th this is rewinding a little bit, but I'm just curious and, and, and a, a little bit unrelated, but like you moved to Paris in the late, from, were you living, you were living in New York City before you moved yeah, to? Yeah, I was living in New York. Right, 86 is when I moved. Okay. Um, what was Paris yeah. like when you moved there? Was it, was it, and how's it uh, changed? Paris maybe? was, yeah. <laughs> Paris was, when I moved here, Paris was great. It was like a collection of small towns mm. put together into a big city. Mm -hmm. Like each, each part of Paris was a little village. Now it's become, Paris is, has, has fallen the way of many big cities and become a little bit bigger and faster and mm -hmm. noisier. Although I have to say, after, with, with this lockdown, things changed. I mean, it's a kind of a, we're in sort of a funny moment. Musicians are in a very difficult moment now because I personally uh, fear that it will be a little while before we have we get back to I don't know to normal whatever. Right. To uh, we get back to having concerts and playing playing in full theaters and things like that. Uh, it's a kind of a funny. Funny, and but it's made Paris uh, much cleaner. <laughs> the air is cleaner, and, uh, but it's going back to normal now quickly. But Paris is a good city, and it's a good. I mean, the conservatory uh, is a wonderful place to teach. Yeah, I was I was asked to teach uh, by one of the directors, the director of the early music program, who who was a Dutch guy. His name was Jan Nuchelmans. And Jan asked me to come in because he known me from Freiburg of, oh, of, wow. as, as well as other places. But we've known each other for a long time. And so he asked me to come and start a class, uh, which, I, which I started with just two people. And I built up now. And I have now people doing diplomas instead of... We started it just as a secondary instrument for the modern bass players. Because some of the bass players really wanted to know. Uh, some of them think that some of them, the guys that I've taught, thought in the beginning, that, well, this is like, you know, uh, Alice in Wonderland. They get paid so much and they've got these great gigs and, you know, they, they go grinding all over the world playing. And of course, it was no different than any other world. But we were we were we were all struggling for gigs like everybody else. Yeah. So, you know, it was not quite this idyllic world that they seem to uh, imagine. <clears throat> but it was friendlier in the sense that we had a chance to explore. We had a chance to follow our ears a little bit, follow our noses a little bit and say, okay, what if we do it like this? What if we play this? What if we do that? What if we don't listen to what our teachers told us <laughs> to do? Uh, you know, and, 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 what if, and, and what if we take the things that we learned? You know, I'm, I'm not ready to play by candlelight with a, with a 18th century costume on, I, I, I live in the 21st century, and so I have to play with 21st century standards. Mm -hmm. You know, recordings 
you can hear twice or three times. So, you, you know, it's all, it's all, that's probably why the English and the Dutch were ahead of everybody in early music because they recorded more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And you learn from recording. You, you hear what it really sounds like, you know, not what you think it sounds like. So, so it was all open. It was all an open field for us. And, uh, and in the non-institutionalized character of the early music world was really what we were all looking for. Now it's kind of going flipping back over and we're sort of institutionalizing the early music world. Yeah. Like we're doing to jazz mm -hmm. the same way. You know, people learn to play jazz in the conservatory now, not in a bar. Right. And I remember you, you were just talking about how when Juilliard uh, adopted early music, you know, not too many years ago, they finally started a jazz yeah. program at Juilliard. Probably a lot later than most other places, but that's it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because, it, because they, they realized that they had to do something. They had to follow suit. They had to do something to change. Early music existed. Albert Fuller, Albert Fuller taught at Juilliard for years, but they kind of rejected his his overtures into really going further. Now from him, I learned about French music and from Jacques Schroeder and from William Christie here in Paris, I played a, a big French operas. And, and um, so there, there, it's a whole different way of playing. And it's a, a, the, the French never had the six string violone in G like Italy or Germany. They went right from gambas and bass de violon right to a double bass. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the beginning of the, in the 17 oh something so one of the composers came back from a trip from Italy with a double bass and they used it in an opera uh, Marais Marais used it in an opera right away so they really the, the double bass when people say it doesn't belong in early baroque music well it depends which kind of early baroque music you're talking about yeah. and i mean the 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 bases there were bases being made in the late 1500s you know, Gasparo de Salo yeah. and, and Zanetto and Pellegrino and these guys. Uh, and and they were not making them as, as a decor. They were making them to be played. Now, we don't really know how long the string length was, how many strings there were, if there were three strings, four strings, five strings, six strings. I, we, we don't really know. We know, for instance, that Gasparo de Salo, these basses look incredibly like the gambas and the liras that he made, the smaller instruments. Mm -hmm. So it's basically the same pattern. So it might be that he wanted to have six strings on the big double basses. But quickly, people realized, I've seen basses, one here in Paris in the museum from 1600 something, six, the beginning of the first decade of the 17th century, made in, uh, in, in Germany, and one in Vienna, there's an instrument in Vienna in the museum both of them had three strings originally, and uh, three, uh, not uh, mechanics, but you know, tuning pegs, three pegs. And uh, so the three string bass is an idea that is not new into the, to Dragonetti. It's, uh, it's, it was around quite a while before then. Oh. Well, Richard, I have like 25 more things I want to talk with you about. Uh, like, like, we'll um, continue. okay, let me, maybe we can, maybe we can, we can, uh, but we can, we can stop there for today and do a okay. round two some other time because, and, and over zoom is great. Uh, yeah. in per, in person is even better. So hopefully I'll be headed well, to Paris or that you will we'll see Paris or if I'm ever in California, uh, I'll make it my business because, uh, yeah, it would be great. I mean, you're doing really nice things, you know? Richard, thank you so much. And let's do a round two in the future for sure. I love covering with interesting people, different topics. And if I look back over the 13 years, it is 13 years, I think, right? Yeah. Of the podcast, this topic has come up, certainly not as much as a lot of other topics. And I don't even remember the last time it came. Maybe, uh, maybe, uh, Kristen Zernig, maybe was that the last time? Oh dear. That was maybe a couple of years ago. So I'm so glad to talk about this and to talk about this with an interesting person like Richard. So thank you, sir. And we will do 
it again soon. Thank you for listening. I, if, if you get to this point, uh, you, you may get to this point frequently on these episodes, so you probably know that I record these in batches. This is four of four. It's a Friday morning. I'm looking out at the sun. I got to make a run to Trader Joe's to get some things for the weekend, so I'm about to wrap up here. And I have been trying to not go stir crazy, probably like, like you as well. Going on runs most days has helped. I am fortunate uh, in so many ways in my life, I know. Um, and I, I feel and empathize for people who uh, are in situations much worse than mine. I think the, the most, the thing that I'm just struggling with is the monot- monotony is a bad word probably, but just the sameness of every single day. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, um, but I'm for one of the ways in which I'm very fortunate, or I think so anyway, is that we live in San Francisco. We live in a beautiful area on the Northeast waterfront and I have this run that ends at the Golden Gate Bridge, which is a, a pretty cool. And I try not to flex on that run too much on social media. I'm sort of used used to that uh, now, which is a nice thing to get used to. And then I realized, like, ah, I'm, I'm being a doofus fo- posting all these Golden Gate Bridge photos. But that has been helpful for me, just sort of evening things out. I did that this morning. And like with base practicing, I, I at the moment, I'm filming these goofy videos going through Dennis Whitaker's incredibly useful exercises, uh, 16 volumes. So I think I just filmed volume five and, and, you know, working on my craft on the base and just kind of like trying to keep my body in good shape and kind of move, you know, make gains, I I guess, you know, try to maybe go a little further, uh, do a few more sit-ups or push-ups, that kind of thing. I definitely have been thinking about those parallels a lot. I'm 44 right now, so I'm not 64, but I'm not 24 either. And I'm I'm noticing that both on base and when I'm working out, you know, I'm I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I'm I'm finding that line where I am pushing myself a little bit, but not into injury. And I've both, I don't know, there's something about filming these videos. I think it makes me tense up a little bit because it's weird to have it. I film with a GoPro on my head. It's a little bit weird to just do that. And then I, I don't know. I don't feel like I'm tense, but I do notice when I get done, maybe it's from talking and playing and trying to show things. I feel a little tense there. So I don't know this whole, this whole week. And then I've been making these runs like eight miles round trip, but four miles of actual running four miles of somewhere between total walking and maybe a little walk running you know trying to watch out for my knees trying to watch out for my my right calf like charlie horsed on me as i was walking back which i found completely weird i was just i have no idea why my left knee has been not really giving me trouble but i've been like oh you know aware of it so um yeah, getting old stinks. <laughs> I don't know why I'm talking about this. It's just on my mind. Anyway, I, I think, you know, I can't control getting, yeah, I guess this is probably why I started talking about it. I can't control getting older, but what can I control? I can control what I do with my time and and trying to get a little bit better as a person. I do think that that's a big reason. Of, I think there are many reasons why I do this podcast, but that is a big reason why I've stuck with it because I do feel like it's another one of those things like running or practicing or working out that does help me to stretch and grow and reach out to new people and do research I probably wouldn't have done and listen to music I probably wouldn't have done. So if you can find a project like that in your life, whether it's exercise, whether it's working on your musical craft or composition or something that's more outwardly well some of those are outwardly facing but maybe even more outwardly facing like a a blog or a podcast or a video series uh i think it's great i think it's a, a wonderful thing to do no matter where you are at in life okay i must go to trader joe's so let me thank the team michael cooper steve hinchy mitch mooring trevor jones and krista copper by the way trevor has this very cool program that you've you've heard about because he did uh take over a few weeks ago but the scholarship roadmap i'm really impressed with what he's been doing and also thinking about someone who's leveling up what he's done he's already been performing at a very high level on the internet for a long time he's 
been in the band Mole Hill for a long time. He's been on the podcast several times over the years too. But even with the scholarship roadmap, just at roadmap, just as a content creator, from me from one content creator observing another one, to watch him up his game has been really cool. So check out what he's been doing. Just look up the scholarship roadmap. Well, you can just look it up on Google or go to any social media platform and watch what he's been doing in terms of the videos, in terms of what he's been posting, how he's been posting. It's really cool. And I, I find it inspiring, actually. It's made me kind of uh, get excited about the projects I'm doing. And thank you, Mitch Mooring. You rock. You make great basses. In addition to putting together these podcasts, basses, award-winning, beautiful, all the good things. So check him out, MitchMooring.com. All right. We are going to sign off. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again for more life on the low end of the spectrum. <laughs>